Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Mader Powell, and welcome to this talk on uh, a project called Making the Link, uh, Lloyd's Casualty Returns and the National Monuments Record of Wales. I hope to show you um, during this talk um, an overview of a six month project which has managed to enhance Welsh shipwreck records held at the Royal Commission um, by linking with the digital resources of Lloyd's, um, Lloyd's casualty returns, which is held by the Lloyd's Register Foundation's Heritage and Education Centre. So, as I said, it's a six month project and it's been funded by Lloyd's. Um, and what I'll do is I'll begin by talking you through, I'll give you a brief introduction to the two institutions. And then I'll talk you through the process of um, linking up the records and enhancing the shipwreck records of the Royal Commission. And then we'll turn to um, take a look in more detail at a few examples um, of some of the Welsh ship, the shipwrecks that lie in Welsh waters. And I hope to show you also that um, how important these documentary sources are for our understanding of shipwrecks and how our knowledge of shipwrecks derive from documentary sources. So um, without further ado, I will um, begin to share my, um, my screen with you. So I will just do that. Um, there's a few slides we need to get through. So. Okay. So for those who aren't aware, um, the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Wales is a Welsh government funded um, or sponsored institution that has a key role in developing and understanding <clears throat> the archaeological built um, and maritime heritage of Wales. The commission was established in 1908 and it has a curatorial and investigative role <clears throat> and provides information for individuals, uh, corporations, uh, local authorities, governmental bodies, um, researchers, and the general public alike. And the Commission holds um, plenty of, um, of records. It has a unique collection of photographs, maps, images, um, reports, um, all, all stored in its archive, which is the um, National Monuments Record of Wales. NMRW. And these can be consulted online via Corvline. Uh, Corv meaning memory and line, obviously online. So um, yes, yeah, so, so a lot of the collections are available online. And as you can see from the image there, the Royal Commission's offices uh, are held um, or are in the same building as the National Library of Wales in Aberystwyth. Now, the Heritage and Education Centre is Lloyd's Register Foundation's Public Library and Collections Archive. They're based in London and they hold material covering over 250 years of uh, marine and engineering science and history. Lloyd's Register Foundation is, um, is, is a charity. It was set up in 2012 but is a product of a much older organization dating back to the 18th century. Um, and this is when a group of men decided to meet in Edward Lloyd's coffee shop in London to discuss publishing a register to record ships quality, uh, classification and safeguard life and property uh, carried on them. <clears throat> and over the years, Lloyd's developed uh, expertise across the um, uh, energy and um, transportation sector. And its maritime records are now held by um, the Heritage and Education Centre. So these records include things such as uh, Lloyd's Register of Ships, um, World Fleet Statistics, uh, List of Surveyors, Ship Plan and um, Survey Reports, um, and much, much more. This particular project that we've been um, conducting is concerned with Lloyd's uh, casualty returns. And these returns record the total losses of vessels over 100 gross tons worldwide within incremental periods. And the returns for 1890 to 2000 
have been digitized and been made uh, available online on Internet Archive. And thereby allowing the Royal Commission to link directly through hyperlinks from its um, records of shipwreck to these original primary sources um, and the shipwreck en entries in the casualty returns. Now, when we talk about Welsh shipwrecks, not, not they're not necessarily Welsh in terms of where they were registered. Um, we, we consider those shipwrecks that um, occurred within these boundaries. So as you can see from this image, you have the boundaries for Welsh waters. So anything, any vessels over 100 gross tons uh, wrecked within these boundaries, um, this project has recorded for the years 1890 to 2000. So let's take a look at a few of a uh, few examples of these casualty returns. So here are the returns for 1895. Um, and I should say here that the, um, the, the style guide and the way they present information changes over time. Um, but you still get a heck of a lot of information in these returns. Um, it's just the formatting changes, as you can imagine, over 100 years. So, as you notice here, um, these uh, early ones are published quarterly, with the first quarter running from the 1st of January to the 31st of March. Now, at the beginning, uh, we get a breakdown by nationality of all ships lost during the quarter. And here is a page for all steamships. There's a similar page for um, sailing vessels. And then we have exactly the same kind of page, same outline of statistics for both steamships and sailing vessels combined. Now, as you can see from these records, um, we have um, the different categories. So um, we have the abandoned at sea, burnt, collision, foundered, lost, missing, uh, wrecked, and also bro broken up and condemned, etc. And those ships that are in the broken up and condemned category obviously don't occur at sea. They, they often occurred at, at, the, at the ports. Um, so the first section then lists those steamships that were lost uh, in the first quarter. And at the top of the returns, we have a key for nationalities and also a key for description. And this is, if you look at the nationalities, um, it's, it's a very, very much a sign of the times, as we can see uh, the British colonies being re represented, as is Austria-Hungary um, and, and Hawaii as well. So before Hawaii was annexed in um, 1898. Um, then we have the key for ship description, which um, is very important for identification purposes. And as I mentioned earlier, the different categories, which I've noted on the right hand side there. So these are the categories for all the steamships, and they're also the same categories used for recording uh, sailing vessels uh, lost. So the returns provide a um, range of information. Um, regarding each casualty, although some details uh, are sometimes lacking, as you can see here. Now, on the left hand side in the far left column, we do have a number, and this is the number for that particular vessel in, that appears in the registry of ships, uh, Lloyd's Register of Ships, which is another digital resource available from the Heritage and Education Centre. <clears throat> Um, next to that, we have the name of the vessel and the year of build, and we have the tonnage, the registration country, along with the description. And then we have um, in, the very um, informative information regarding our project, the, the really important information, I, I guess, regarding the circumstances and place of the shipwreck, um, along with the voyage, cargo, and also date. And these are the um, information. This is the information that we're really looking for um, when trying to record Welsh shipwrecks. Um, so, yes, as you can see on this page, there are three examples: the Antonio, the Ely, and the Maplefield. And in the category, uh, in the column for sh circumstances and place, you'll notice sometimes we have geographical locations, and sometimes we have uh, coordinates. 
So for the Antonio, for example, um, it's capsized and sank after collision in latitude 5137 north and longitude 510 west. Um, from these coordinates, we can map them um, and we find out, oh, actually, that's, that's very much in Welsh waters. Sometimes we get uh, geographical locations. So the maple field there says four miles east of St. Govan Lighthouse, Light Vessel. Um, and occasionally you get um, geographical locations and coordinates which is great because that allows us to really map um, fairly precisely um, or give an approximation of, of where uh, the shipwreck occurred. Um, for the Antonio, in this case, actually, uh, those coordinates um, turn out to be about four and a half miles south of St. Anne's Head in Pembrokeshire. Um, and for the, um, for the Ely, that is uh, about 30 miles west of Aberdaron. Now, fast forward 100, 100 years to 1995, and you'll see a very different um, sort of out, um, different presentation of these statistics. So to begin with, they're called world casualty statistics. Um, and we have a fairly detailed preface in these modern casualty returns. And you'll notice here that some of the definitions have altered somewhat. So we now have fire and explosion, a category for that. We have a category for contact and also the wrecked and stranded. Um, the wreck definition has been expanded to include um, stranded as well. And alongside these, we do have formal definitions, which is very useful. Um, yeah, and then again, towards the beginning of these modern uh, casualty returns, we have classification of the ships and the ship descriptions. Uh, quite useful. Um, not sure if you can see that screen very well because it's quite small print, but again, that as an example of all the different classifications that are presented in the casualty returns. Um, further on, we get um, lots of tables and statistics and summaries of recent years, which are very informative. So here we see the casualties of 1995 set against previous years in the top table there. Um, and the top table, yeah, that denotes um, ship losses. While the second table beneath um, shows the lives lost. Um, and the lives lost is a, an additional piece of information that wasn't previously presented in the casualty returns in the earlier casualty returns. So we see new forms of presenting statistics and, and new, um, new information coming to light in latter casualty returns. We also get um, sort of rundowns of the countries which lost the most ships during those years. So in the 1995 returns, we see that Japan lost uh, the most with 20 ships lost at sea, Panama losing 18 as well. And this, as you can imagine, is very, very different to 100 years previously. So on the bottom there, I've just um, uh, shown you a clip of the 1895 returns where Britain lost 225 ships at sea that year, um, the most in the world and Norway uh, was second in the list um, having lost um, 180, uh, 182 ships at sea. Um, so yeah, very, very different to 1995, but what these return, what this demonstrates actually is how the returns reflect changes in, in politics and in economics, in global, um, in global patterns. Um, and, and they're very useful then in allowing us to contextualize Welsh shipwrecks further. Um, so sticking with the 1995 returns, we finally get to the actual list of casualties on page uh, 28. Uh, and here is called the Appendix 1. And here is um, page 35 of that list. So we notice that the losses are listed by classification and no longer listed uh, in quarterly. So the quarterly returns are no longer a thing. So we have all losses for the whole year listed um, according to the classification. So here we, for example, we have a continuation of the general cargo ships lost, moving into passenger general cargo and then refrigerated cargo. Um, and 
although the layout and the format is quite different, then we still get the essential information required for um, records purposes. So we still get the registration of ships, um, the, the name of the ship, tonnage, the year it was built and the circumstances surrounding its loss. Um, war losses. Um, for the two world wars in the 20th century, for these periods, an additional category was uh, included, uh, which was the war losses. Um, and as you can imagine, these were quite, quite, quite long. Um, and often they hold little or no information uh, as to their circumstances or location, which makes it almost impossible to, to locate them. However, um, up until 1915, we did have a bit more information. Um, so here, for example, is a category for sunk by warships or by mines. And you'll notice that there is a, um, uh, there is a column for circumstances and place of loss. And here we do have a geographical location which is great because that allows us to then map these um, casualties. Um, and for the Kanbank, yes, 10 miles east of Point Linus in, uh, on the north coast of Anglesey. But for most war losses, um, after 1915, uh, this is how they appeared in both world wars, pretty much. Um, as you can see, there is very little information presented here. Um, if we look at the bottom there on the right hand side is is the coal mirror i've just boxed in red and all we get is the vessel's name its number in the registry book um tonnage registration and the description which is a steel screw steamship um, it appears in the quarterly list for october to december 1917 um, and yeah this is pretty much impossible for us to map however um Fortunate for this project, a previous project of a Royal Commission, looking at um, merchant vessels lost during the First World War in Welsh waters, had already identified the Cormier. Uh, this project was the, the U-Boat project. <clears throat> um, and from this project's database of uh, vessels sunk, um, I was able to link another hundred, over a hundred more um, vessels to their original entries in the casualty returns, such, uh, just such as here with the Colmere. A couple more examples for you uh, is the Norwegian and Portuguese steamers, the Janvold and the Damao, um, listed in the war losses for the second quarter of 1918. Uh, as you can see, we can't, again, can't really locate them from the information given here, <clears throat> but luckily these were two further um, steamships identified by uh, the Commission's previous project. Now here is the project's website, um, U-Boat project uh, commemorating the war at sea, and if you've, uh, there will be a link to these um, vessels um, in the new Covline, um, but if you visit the website you'll just go to the Rex tab and then you'll have a drop-down um, list of several um, several vessels which have received quite a lot of research on them. Um, yeah, and it's an excellent resource, this website. It, it allows users to make, make um, further connections from the original, from the original um, casualty returns and from the edited, from the enhanced Covline entries. There's um, plenty of information here you get to do, um, you get to read a lot about their history, the, you get a, um, a virtual tour of the shipwrecks. There's lots of um, digital imagery of these vessels. Um, here's a still from the one of the virtual tours of the Damao. There's also a very good mapping tool here. So you click on the map tab and you'll get, um, you'll get locations of all the uh, shipwrecks identified by the project uh, that were lost because of U-boat activity during the First World War. And then on these blobs, you can um, click on them and to, to bring up further information. So that's one previous project, which the current project, making the link, has connected with. Um, <clears throat> now, I mentioned Covline just now. Um, for those who aren't aware of what Covline is, so Covline is the online catalog of the national um, monuments record of Wales. 
Um, so here is where the Royal Commission keeps its, um, uh, its data, basically its, its records of uh, heritage sites. And users here can and search the catalog, uh, can search heritage sites across Wales. Covline is currently being revamped. So in a what you see here will be slightly different to its new appearance in a few weeks time. But um, you'll still be able to search uh, in two, two particular ways. So I've just highlighted in red boxes at the bottom there, search site records and Covline mapping. Uh, the mapping tool is great. So once you click on that, uh, it will bring up a map of Wales and you can zoom in and out. And it allows you to essentially draw a box with the cursor on, on your mouse. And that will then bring up all the heritage sites within that geographical location. For example, here, I've zoomed in on Pembrokeshire coast and drawn a box around it. And we've got over two and a half thousand heritage sites recorded by the Royal Commission in this particular area. And all these uh, red dots, you'll be able to, um, to zoom in and out on them and to click on them individually to bring up their own um, information page, and their own records page. Um, the search sites record is a bit more traditional. So here you'll type in uh, a, a name of a, of a vessel or a, it could be a chapel or something or a castle or um, a hill fort that you're aware of. In this instance, i have just shown you, um, there's a tab there, the site type that you'll type in wreck for a shipwreck. Um, and then if you click search, then that will bring up nearly 6,000 uh, records of shipwrecks in Welsh waters. Um, if you see there, halfway down, there is the Anteros. And uh, if we click on the Anteros, it will bring up its Covline page, which is this, its current Covline page. Um, so here we get its catalog details on the left-hand side, and then we have a description of the site um, and the historical and event information as well, along with a, a sources section. So um, everything the Royal Commission does is bilingual, of course. Um, so the, the website is bilingual. Um, the information inputted here, the, the typed up historical information will always be in English, however. Um, yes, so and that's pretty much cobbling how you search and the kind of details that the site pages have. Just to, uh, to show you, the Anteros then is linked um, here in the war losses for January to March 1918 um, the, in the casualty returns. So in the new Covline page for the Anteros, it will have a hyperlink directly to the original source here. <clears throat> Now, the usual method of linking up uh, the resources was um, to go through the casualty returns year by year uh, and note those vessels that were likely to be in or very much in Welsh waters. And then I would search the Royal Commission's database um, for the vessel and more often than not, I would get a match. And then I could um, edit any information needed and then obviously create those hyperlinks to the original sources. Um, to the original entries in the casualty returns. There were several, uh, several entries, however, that were not previously recorded by the Royal Commission. Uh, this is great because that's one of the kind of aims of the project, which was not only to enhance current existing records, but also to add new records to the Royal Commission. Um, so that's been very fruitful in, in that sense. If I just show you here, the current page for the Angelica, um, a vessel that was uh, shipwrecked off the Pembrokeshire coast. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that Covlin is being revamped. So in the new version, there will be um, all, all entries, all shipwreck entries for the years 1890 to 2000 will have hyperlinks to, the, to their entries in the casualty returns. Um, so here we see the current page for the Angelica. And we see the catalog information on the left hand side. We see a site description, uh, event and historical information, and the sources used. Now, I can't quite show you the, the, new, uh, the new page, the new Covline page for the Angelica, 
but I am showing you here the um, the kind of editing um, page in the Arches system that we use. <clears throat> and as you can see, I've highlighted a few of the sources there. So in red um, and blue, those will be sources that will be hyperlinked to external resources, external digital resources. Um, and in red are the links to the vessels entries in the casualty returns. And also on the bottom, there will be a hyperlink to the wider digital collections held by Lloyd's um, Heritage and Education Centre. In blue would be the hyperlinks to um, the vessels reference in contemporary newspapers and also in the uh, Board of Trade Inquiries and the UK Hydrographic Office uh, website. Um, so that's kind of one of the main aims of the project is to create these hyperlinks that will allow users then to um, have easy access to their original um, references in, in primary sources. So um, some statistics for you. Um, to date, and it is a constant revision uh, process going on, but to date there have been um, there's over 500 shipwrecks, um, 508 shipwrecks entries that will have direct um, direct link to their entries in the casualty returns. There are three of them missing links, um, I'm calling them. Uh, I just can't quite find them in the um, casualty returns at the moment, but hopefully they will come to light and there'll be up to 511 um, with hyperlinks to the casualty returns. So of these uh, numbers, there's over 50 uh, are new, new records, which the Royal Commission didn't previously have. And there's over 100 records being connected with the previous UBOS project. Um, so it's, again, it's, it's creating this um, network of resources that um, users can, can go to from their Kovlin pages. So as I, as I mentioned, I, I've managed to um, link with newspaper sources. Um, and in doing this, we used uh, the National Library of Wales's resource, Welsh Newspapers Online, <coughs> which has digitized Welsh newspapers from 1804 to 1919. And this provides another layer of information to those shipwrecks, um, which we can add to the records. Now finding the shipwrecks in the newspapers wasn't always successful. Um, so there are a few gaps, um, but nevertheless, those links that we have managed to, um, to add, uh, I think contributes, um, as you'll see, it contributes a certain human element, human stories to these shipwrecks, uh, rather than just the statistics, the cold statistics of casualty returns and, and map plotting. So for example, um, here is the Primrose Hill, uh, an iron four-masted bark sailing ship en route from Liverpool to Vancouver. When in December 1900, it uh, became wrecked on Penrose Rocks, just off Anglesey. Now here is its entry in the casualty returns. And here is the Primrose Hills Kovlin page. However, uh, a newspaper search brings up um, very um, interesting information. So in the Evening Express, not only do we get a list of the crew, um, but also a report on the disgraceful scenes uh, at Hollyhead. And it reads, a gang of marauders pounced upon casks of liquor, which were part of the cargo washed ashore. And some of them became helplessly drunk. Others tried to do away with other commodities. Up to Saturday evening, 11 bodies had been recovered and several loafers who had previously declined to assist in recovering bodies without assurance of payment were afterwards found lying drunk among corpses. So not a particularly pleasant scene to imagine. Um, we do get some more cheery episodes um, in the newspapers. So here, for example, is Evan Mendes, the master of the sailing ship, the Bronwyn, uh, who was very keen to praise and to thank the assistance uh, of local residents in Newquay after the ship became shipwrecked um, en route from Andor Santa Cadiz in September 1891. And here is his letter um, to the South Wales to the editor of the South Wales Daily News.
Um, we also get some really fascinating stories such as this one. So here is um, a newspaper praising the heroic women of the local village. So in December 1900, the Norwegian bark Ragnar was shipwrecked in Abervillen Bay in Pembrokeshire in, in quite terrible weather. And a report of the rescue efforts is had in the Evening Express, as you see here, um, where the correspondent gets detailed interviews with survivors and also with the captain. And we also get reference to the heroic women of Trevine, uh, Trevine being the nearest village who participated in the rescue efforts. Uh, and many, many villagers assisted in trying to bring the crew ashore, but the report was quite keen to emphasize the role of the women. And it reads, the women showed the men a noble example, and it was owing to their pluck and bravery that so many lives were spared, for their example put heart into the men. And then we get an interview um, with Andrew Boyanson, uh, one of the ship's mates, <clears throat> who said, I jumped into the sea with the rest, but it was awful work. I was nearly done up when I reached the beach and should have been washed back into the sea had a woman not taken hold of me and dragged me ashore. Um, we get plenty more um, incidences of, of quite detailed interviews with, with survivors and uh, where correspondents get um, access to, to the site and to uh, interview um, eyewitnesses and therefore we sometimes get very um, detailed reports of the incidents of the shipwrecks. So here is one from February 1907 where um, a disastrous collision between two steamships, the um, Oriana and the Heliopolis occurred in the Bristol Channel. The Oriana was carrying coal from Cardiff to Spezia uh, when just after midnight it collided with the steamer Heliopolis. And the newspaper wrote, the Oriander was struck amidships with such a terrific force that she began to sink before the members of the crew had fully realized what had happened. Within half an hour, she had disappeared entirely and gone to the bottom of the sea. After the collision, it seems the Heliopolis continued on his journey, um, on his voyage to Cardiff. As the crew of the Oriander battled for their lives, a nearby Swedish steamship, the Ebba, and a Barry pilot boat captained by Mr. Sparks uh, were at hand, fortunately enough, to rescue, uh, to, to assist in the rescue efforts, but sadly not before 14 of the Oriander's crew had drowned. And we're given a list of the crew um, in the newspaper reports, uh, those who survived and those who perished. And the newspapers often give uh, lists of crew members, again, sometimes noting those who survived and those who perished. Now here are a few more examples. So on the left hand side here, we see the crew of the steamship Mareka. And notice the different nationalities that are represented. So we have Wales, England, um, Scotland, Russia, Germany, Sweden, Iceland, uh, Norway. And these really do represent the sort of international nature of merchant fleets. Um, and yes, the, the, the value of newspapers then are very important because the, we get these um, crew lists um, along with the details of the incidents themselves and, and um, testimonies and eyewitness reports. So we also get sometimes, very rarely, however, um, photographs, images of these shipwrecks. So here is a photograph of the British sailing ship, uh, the Vera Jean, wrecked at Hoots Point, um, Barry Island in September 1908. And here is the sailing ship, the Amazon, uh, which was uh, supposed to carry coal from Port Albert to Chile. And this, um, this ship was wrecked near Margam on the same day as the Vera Jean. Now, the Amazon is quite a sad story. Um, 20 of the crew, <coughs> crew members died, uh, drowned in the initial, in the in initial uh, wreck. Uh, one crew member died after being rescued from injuries, um, and only seven survived the incident. Now, often with shipwrecks, um, bodies are washed ashore days or sometimes weeks after the event. Um, in the Cambrian on 11th of September, a letter was published of one of the crew members who drowned from the Amazon. His name was A.T. Orr uh, from Glasgow, 
And here is his letter writing to his relatives just before setting sail from Port Talbot docks. And he provides details of the preparations, uh, the journey, the cargo, and how his family might keep tabs of him on his movements. And he finished the letter by bidding, quote, goodbye to all. And although I am far away, I will not forget that I came from 13 Hamden Terrace and that I had a good father and mother, your affectionate rascal, A.T.O. And notice that he uses quotation marks for father and mother. And this does suggest quite a few things here. Um, and also he describes himself as your affectionate rascal at the end. And I think that's quite, that's quite endearing and also quite cheeky, but also desperately sad as well to, to read this letter, knowing that those were essentially his final words to his family. Um, other reports in the newspapers weren't quite as informative, um, just consisting of short one line or a few lines from a telegram, uh, often from the Press Association or Central News Agency, but often also from Lloyd's agents. Um, so a network of agents had been established by Lloyd's during the 19th century, um, with around 300 agents at ports worldwide. And sometimes we get the names of these agents in the newspaper reports in Wales. Uh, and these agents were also involved in assessing the wrecks afterwards. So yeah, these, these examples here of the telegrams, I think they show more than anything how important Lloyds were um, in the reporting of shipping news uh, in the daily and weekly press of, of, of uh, across Wales. And they highlight as well just how busy and dangerous the, the shipping lanes were around the Welsh coasts and in the Welsh waters. So again, some statistics for you here. So we've managed to link over 200 shipwreck entries with newspaper articles. Many of these have more than one um, newspaper source, um, also in Welsh and in English language. So the total number of newspaper links we've managed to make is comfortably over 250 for this project. Um, now, the use of newspapers was also quite useful in uh, clarifying other sources. So here is the example of the wooden brigantine, the Agile, in the 1909 casualty returns. And you see it on the right hand side there in the circumstances and place, it notes the Bristol Channel. Now, as there's no more specific information at hand to locate this, the, the site, the Royal Commission uses maritime named locations um, for certain areas uh, that don't have a specific location in sight. So in this instance, um, the maritime name location for Bristol Channel has a central grid reference and therefore all entries that only have Bristol Channel are assigned this particular location. It's a central, it's a central general grid reference um, and until further information comes to light um, regarding its location, then th that, that particular record will always have this site. So the Agile is located here. Um, however, with a newspaper search, it brings up very inter interesting information. So we have um, a description of the event and also a location noted as Barnstaple Bay. Now, Barnstable Bay, of course, is off the north coast of Devon. So if we return to the map, um, a more, more precise location would be um, circled there in Barnstable Bay. And therefore, the Agile would lie outside Welsh waters. So the maritime name location, therefore, has been, um, well, new information has now come to light. And therefore, we can remove the Agile from the Royal Commission's database as it no longer um, lies in Welsh waters. So there are other entries in the returns. For example, here is the Belgian steamer, the Torquenar. And again, just like the Agile, it notes in the Bristol Channel. So the Torquenar would, would be assigned that Bristol Channel maritime name location. Um, but we don't have any further information as to the, the precise location for this steamship, uh, such as we had for the Agile. So for now, the Torquenar is included in the database um, of shipwrecks in Welsh waters. 
Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's very likely that many other vessels uh, have this, the, the same location. Um, but again, this is just for the time being until further information comes to light. Um, so yeah, for now, the Torquana is uh, considered in, the, uh, in Welsh waters. Um, yeah, so, so hopefully in linking directly to Lloyd's digital resources, um, not only the casualty reports, but also at the bottom of each shipwreck page on, on the new calls line, there will be a direct hyperlink to the wider digital resources at Lloyd's. Um, so by doing this, hopefully users will get to explore further uh, and pursue their research further uh, there. And Lloyd's Heritage and Education Centre, they hold uh, ship plans and surveys for uh, thousands of vessels. Um, so here are a couple of examples. On the left hand side here, we have the Gulf of St. Vincent. And here is the report of survey for repairs for 1890, uh, 10th of July. And this was actually just seven days before it shipwrecked off the north coast of Anglesey. On the right hand side there, uh, we have the um, report of survey for repairs for the Amazon, the, the ship we saw earlier, um, which ATO sadly drowned uh, during the shipwreck. Um, and this is dated 1899. Um, and yeah, the, the, the Amazon, of course, ran ashore on Margam Sands in 1908. So uh, this is just an example of the, the, the extra, the, the digital resources that are held by Her Lloyd's Heritage and Education Center, which um, will be linked directly from the, um, the new updated enhanced covline pages of the shipwrecks that the Royal Commission has. So um, that pretty much sums up the, the project, I, I hope uh, you've, you've followed. Um, so yeah, not only has this project enhanced the Royal Commission's existing records, it's managed to add new records, um, over 50 new new, rec, new shipwrecks have been recorded. Um, and all these now will have hyperlinks to external resources. Um, everyone, every one of them will have a link to their original entry in the casualty returns and then further entries then, further links to um, sort of um, newspaper entries, <clears throat> their entries in newspapers and uh, board of trade inquiries, reports, merchant, uh, mercantile navy lists for those uh, sunk during the war, during the First World War. Um, yes, yeah, so, so it's creating a more connected network of online digital resources from uh, where the users who read uh, on, well, on the shipwrecks on the Kovlin pages can then access easily at a click of a mouse. So, um, yes, I hope you've enjoyed. Um, I hope it's been of use to you. If you have any questions, please um, just um, yeah, feel free to, to send me an email on the address on screen there. Um, alternatively, just drop a line, drop a comment in the in the box below this video. Um, and yeah, hopefully you, you've it's been of some value to you. And um, Again, those are the links on the screen to the Royal Commission's website and also to the Lloyd's Register Foundation Heritage and Education Centre's website. Um, by all means, explore them, explore Covline. And as I said, uh, Covline is being revamped at the moment. So in a few weeks time, uh, the new version will be live online and all these hyperlinks will be live and it will allow you to make greater connections with digital resources. So, that sums up the project. That's pretty much the end of the talk. Um, hopefully you've enjoyed and had something from it. And yeah, thank you for joining. So um, that's it. Yeah, thank you. Bye.